good evening. We're thrilled that you're here this evening. Um, I'm Jan Balmer. I'm the current president of the Colonnade Club, and I'm thrilled to see we have such a full room this evening. Um, I'm especially pleased to be able to introduce President Teresa Sullivan, who is going to talk to us today about anti-intellectualism at the public university. So, and the public university. So, from her very busy, yes, nothing like tripping over my own words, huh? Um, and not at. So, um, I am thrilled that she is here. Um, I think this is going to be a really interesting and very timely topic. So, um, I couldn't be more pleased, President Sullivan, that you've joined us tonight. Please. Well, good evening, everybody. It's always a pleasure to speak at the Colonnade Club, and I appreciate the invitation to be with you tonight. So the topic I'm addressing, anti-intellectualism and the public university, <laughs> seems especially pertinent in 2018, given the current state of our national discourse. Almost every day, we hear about alternative facts or fake news. And these charges are often leveled at personnel in higher education, or at the mass media, or at both. So I want to discuss how strains of anti-intellectualism in our culture interact with and conflict with the role of our nation's universities, especially our public universities. I also want to talk about the difference between being elite and being elitist, especially in the case of top universities such as UVA. And I'm going to close by talking about our collective responsibility as members of a university community in helping shape the public's perception of who we are and what we do in higher education and why it's critically important to the nation. So anti-intellectualism is not a new strain in American life, and it takes many forms. Recently, however, there has been a distinctive growth in distrust of higher education and those associated with the academy. This past summer, the Pew Research Center conducted its annual survey of Americans' views of various national institutions, including the news media, colleges and universities, and churches and religious organizations. A majority of the public, 55%, continues to say that colleges and universities have a positive effect on the country, probably the unanimous view of the people here this evening. <laughs> but a substantial number of Americans hold increasingly negative views. A majority of Republicans and Republican-leaning independents, 58%, say that colleges and universities have a negative effect on the country. That's up from 45% 40, the previous year. As recently as three years ago, most Republicans held a positive view of colleges and universities. In September of 2015, 54% of Republicans said colleges and universities had a positive impact on the country, while 37% rated the impact in negative terms. But by 2016, Republicans' ratings of colleges and universities were more mixed, 43% positive, 45% negative. The differences are less striking among Democrats. Wide majorities of both liberal Democrats at 79%, and conservative and moderate uh, Democrats at 67% say colleges have a positive impact. The Pew survey also showed that degree attainment appears to have an effect on one's view of higher education. Since 2015, positive views of colleges and universities have fallen 11 percentage points among Republicans with a college degree, from 44% to 33% but the percentage has fallen 20 points among those who did not go to college, going from 57% uh, to 37%. 
Democrats with higher levels of education are somewhat more positive than those with less education, but large majorities across all groups of Democrats view the impact of college in positive terms. The skepticism and the criticism of higher education is not just an abstraction felt by increasing percentages of the American electorate. It may be part of what is motivating some political leaders to take what they see as corrective action against higher education's apparent faults. Last year, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos told college students in a speech to the Conservative Political Action Committee, and this is a quote, the fight against the education establishment extends to you too. The faculty, from adjunct professors to deans, tell you what to do, what to say, and more ominously, what to think." End quote. In state houses across the country, legislators have introduced bills to guard students and other members of the public against the perceived adverse influence of professors and the colleges and universities that employ them. For example, a state senator in Iowa introduced a bill last year that would require a partisan balance of faculty employed at the state's public colleges and universities. Specifically, the bill mandated that a person shall not be hired as a professor if the person's political party affiliation would cause the percentage of the faculty belonging to one political party to exceed by 10% the percentage of the faculty belonging to the other political party. Note, among other things, the assumption that there will be only two political parties and that everyone will be affiliated with one of them. In another example, two state legislators in Tennessee introduced a bill last year arguing that the state's public colleges and universities had, and here's another quote, abdicated their responsibility to uphold free speech principles, end quote. The bill further argues that these failures make it appropriate for all state institutions of higher education to restate and confirm their commitment in this regard. At least one bill outlining similar concerns about the ability of public universities to guarantee free speech on their campuses was introduced earlier this year in our own General Assembly here in Virginia. I believe it has a good uh, chance of passing, as a matter of fact. The contentious presidential election of 2016 seemed to breathe new life into the anti-intellectual movement. Last year, a survey by Inside Higher Ed and Gallup found that seven in 10 college and university presidents say the presidential election revealed that anti-intellectual sentiment is growing in the United States. Two-thirds of presidents say that campus protests after the election including shouting down guest speakers, have played into an image that higher education is intolerant of conservative views. 41% agreed, while 25% strongly agreed. And finally, a majority of presidents, 55%, say that the election had exposed that academe is disconnected from much of American society. In many ways, anti-intellectualism and the related distrust of higher education is not new. It's been a recurrent theme throughout American history, intertwined with the rhetoric and mudslinging of politicians and cultural commentators, past and present. Historian Richard Hofstadter published his seminal work, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, in 1963, and it went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction the next year. In that book, Hofstadter writes that American intellectuals have often been discouraged or embittered by the national disrespect for the mind throughout the country's history. He goes on to outline how this reached a fever pitch during the McCarthyism of the late 1940s and 1950s. Hofstadter writes, of course, intellectuals were not the only targets of McCarthy's constant detonations. He was after bigger game but intellectuals were in the line of fire and it seemed to give special rejoicing to his followers when they were hit. Given some of the recent examples of anti-intellectualism, 
This excerpt doesn't sound as if it's taken from a dusty history book. It sounds as current as the nightly news, or maybe the news on your Twitter feed. In the decades since the McCarthy era, many more public figures have sought to distance themselves from academics, or at the very least, they sought to poke fun at them. During his 1968 campaign for president, Alabama Governor George Wallace derided bureaucrats and what he called pointy-head college professors, who he joked couldn't even park a bicycle straight. Conservative author William F. Buckley Jr. famously once said, I'd rather entrust the government of the United States to the first 400 people listed in the Boston telephone directory than to the faculty of Harvard University. More recently, during President Obama's first term in office, former vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin told a gathering of Tea Party activists that to win the war on terrorism, we need a commander in chief, not a professor of law standing at the lectern. This kind of knee-jerk rhetoric used in these examples is frustrating to those of us in the academy as any critical remark about one's chosen career path would be. But the anti-intellectual mindset may be causing some of our critics to raise deeper questions about the fundamental value of higher education, and that's much more troubling, especially when you consider all the good that public universities do for our nation. I'm gonna talk now for a while mostly about the public institutions because I believe that they are the ones most susceptible to public pressure and particularly political pressure that carries out this anti-intellectual theme. In 2016, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences produced a report describing how America's public research universities contribute to the public good. Here are some examples. These universities enroll 3.8 million students each year educating young people for employment and citizenship. These universities support the upward social mobility of large numbers of talented young people with financial challenges, many of whom are the first in their families to go to college. More than 30% of the undergraduates who attend the public research universities in the U.S. receive Pell Grants, the grants that the federal government reserves to the lowest income families. In addition to these educational benefits, America's public research universities conduct much of the nation's research in science, medicine, engineering, and technology. As you know, this is a change from an earlier era in which the majority of R&D was actually done by corporations and by national laboratories or industrial laboratories such as Bell Labs. As many of these institutional labs shut down, American research universities stepped up to fill in the gap. As members of our research community know very well, discoveries made by researchers at public institutions have improved health, advanced the economy, created whole new industries, and contributed to public good in many ways. Here's a set of examples. Retractable locking seat belts for automobiles created at the University of Minnesota. The lithium ion battery, a critical component of smartphones and tablets, developed at the University of Texas at Austin. The U.S. Social Security System, developed using social science research conducted at the University of Wisconsin. And recently here at UVA, faculty member Jonathan Kipnis and his team of researchers in the School of Medicine, that team by the way includes 12 undergraduates, made a major discovery that the brain is connected to the immune system by vessels previously thought not to exist. You probably heard about this discovery because it made headlines here at UVA and across the country. This groundbreaking study has implications for the study and treatment of numerous neurological diseases ranging from multiple sclerosis to Alzheimer's disease. Besides educating millions of students from all backgrounds, and by the way, 70% of all PhD uh, graduates come from the public research universities, and creating new products, technologies, and treatments, our public research universities contribute to the public good in many other ways. By teaching and learning in schools, by promoting child development and teen health, by engaging with local communities through lab schools, extension programs, and so on. The list is truly endless. And public universities support the advancement of entire professions 
such as law, medicine, teaching, and engineering. They do all these things in addition to producing educated citizens who are prepared to shape and participate in our society. And yet, in spite of all these contributions to the public good, public higher education remains under attack. I think funding is a critical part of the problem. There are very pragmatic reasons why state legislatures have withdrawn funding from public institutions. But in the beginning, that was not a very popular thing to do. And so justifying it became something of a parlor game among legislators and one way of justifying the action they were more or less forced to take by other economic circumstances was to uh, indicate that the universities didn't deserve it. To talk about how universities were bloated administratively, they were under-regulated, tuition was out of control, and numerous other things that were wrong. Now the disinvestment itself triggered tuition increases in many states because colleges and universities had to make up lost income streams. And rising tuition has led to mounting debt burdens for many college graduates, with national student loan debt now topping the $1 trillion mark. But let me hasten to add that the majority of that debt is not owed to public universities or even to the not-for-profit universities. It is owed to the for-profit universities, which, however, skate by escaping criticism because it is simply assumed that that debt must be coming from our public institutions. The anti-intellectual mindset and the distrust of the academy makes these challenges harder to overcome as the outcry over the growing cost of a college education drowns out all the good news about higher education. And public institutions are more frequent targets for these attacks than the private institutions. But it's important to remember that private institutions have some pretty obvious public characteristics. Private universities receive public subsidies, mostly in the form of tax breaks and student loans and grants. In this state, um, students attending uh, private institutions are eligible for grants from the state legislature. Donors who make gifts to build up the large endowments in universities get a tax exemption for their gifts. The federal government provides need-based financial aid for students in private universities, just as they do in public universities. And private uni research universities, just like public universities, receive government grants and contracts that allow overhead to cover a portion of the research costs. These are public taxpayer-based taxpayer subsidies. So private universities get a pretty sweet deal. They get all of the money from the public subsidies, but none of the regulation that public universities deal with. Now that used to be offset by the fact that we had a reliable stream of revenue coming from the General Assembly. Not so much anymore. In spite of these realities, the publics and privates are moving in opposite directions in terms of prestige and prosperity, and at least partially that's because of the disinvestment in public institutions. And over the years, this trend has begun to do great damage to one of society's greatest social contracts, the contract that promises young people in this country broad access to knowledge and education to help them build their versions of the American dream. One charge levied against colleges and universities, and I've heard it more than once against our own, uh, but it's especially aimed at those that emphasize the liberal arts, is that they are elitist. This has become a kind of code word to suggest that what we teach in a liberal arts program is irrelevant to the skills that are in demand in the workforce, with the further implication that we don't much care whether our graduates are employed or not. Those of us who believe in the liberal arts take the opposite view. We believe a liberal education gives students the most important skills, teaching them to be lifelong critical thinkers, to be perceptive of the world around them, to acquire thoughtful habits of mind, to appreciate cultural differences and to respect human diversity, to approach decision making ethically, and to integrate multiple perspectives before arriving at decisions. Colleges and universities such as ours don't teach students what to think, as some of our critics claim. We teach them how to think. And learning how to think is one of the best possible ways to prepare for today's workforce. 
if you're worried about what AI will do in terms of eliminating jobs in the American economy, one of the best things you can do is to prepare students to be good thinkers, good problem solvers, so that when they have to change jobs, they're able to do so, and to do so with a minimum of disruption. You don't have to take my word for it. Let's listen to the CEOs of America's companies. In a survey of more than 300 CEOs, three quarters of them said they believed a liberal education creates a more effective, dynamic worker than highly specialized training does. And 95% of them said they look for college graduates who think clearly and can solve problems and can communicate their ideas with good oral and written communication skills, precisely the products of a liberal education. If a university were truly elitist, then we wouldn't have such egalitarian goal for our graduates, and we wouldn't provide the kind of public good that a school such as UVA does. In pursuit of our mission at UVA, we provide an excellent, affordable education that develops responsible citizens for leadership and service in the Commonwealth and beyond. We provide world-class patient care. We produce cutting-edge research. We tackle society's most pressing and vexing problems, and we serve as an engine of economic development. And despite the headwinds we face in the public universities, we do a tremendous job of all these things with a continuous desire to improve our efforts. And that's what's being, what being elite is all about, that constant striving for improvement and for greater heights of excellence. It's not at all the same as the tag of elitist that is sometimes given to us. I do want to say a few words about free speech and the free speech uh, controversies that center around higher education. There is certainly a belief, and it goes beyond the legislators who've introduced a few bills, that higher education is a um, ideological monoculture and that we, um, we, will, we will accommodate only one point of view and we or our students as our proxies will shout down any view that is different. I don't believe that is true, but I do believe that we're in an era in which protest is met by counter-protest, and that's an experience that's relatively new for most American universities. Many of them are still working with policies and procedures that were honed during the Vietnam era. And in the Vietnam era, while there might be a few counter-protesters, it was nothing like we see today in the protests, say, in Berkeley. That's posed a new issue for universities in thinking about how to handle it. But the issue is, how do we ensure safety? The issue is not, how do we shut down the beliefs we don't agree with? And sometimes those two objectives get mistaken for each other. The anti-intellectual attitude that pervades the culture today, much of it directed at public higher education, and in spite of all the good we do, is at least partly a public relations problem. As champions of our cause, we need to do a better job of countering our critics by explaining the profound value of public higher education, how it benefits our students, how it benefits our economy, and how it benefits our state and our nation. I must say that faculty members have been known to indulge in a bit of snark from time to time. And sometimes the people around us perceive it as a kind of a snobbery or a belittling of them. Far from being a recognition of their value in a pluralistic society, they read it as a sign that they're being put down. I don't think very many people associated with the university intend that to be the result or intend for people to feel that they have been disrespected by members of the academy. But all too often, I believe that university professors are portrayed as being, shall we say, snooty and snobs, to put it mildly. I think on the contrary, as unashamed intellectuals, we should use our intellectual muscle and our powers of persuasion to make the case for public higher education. And I would emphasize the public part of that. Perhaps if we're lucky, even the anti-intellectuals can be persuaded by a powerful intellectual argument. 
So I think now that we have some time for discussion, I'd like to know if you have some thoughts about this topic that you'd like to share, or if perhaps you have questions for me. I think I see a microphone here, and I see a hand raised over there. So the message um, that I'm getting is that a, a job that we have to do is to communicate the value of public education to those who are not convinced there is one. Um, and obviously we haven't been doing such a good job at this, at least I haven't. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, the ways I want to rephrase what you just said is that th there was a member of my family. Um, and I happen to be the only uh, academician in, the, in this family, uh, said, you know, most professors are snobs, but you're not a snob. <laughs> um, and I didn't know how to respond to that. So I don't know, other than just putting my walking shoes on and going out and telling people that universities are of good value, as you've said, I don't know how else we could do it. I think it's a good problem to discuss. At least one of our issues is the speed of the social media cycle. And most of us were brought up to think pretty carefully about what we wrote and to reflect on it and check our facts and so on. And by the time we've done that, the social media cycle has gone on two or three turns um, and we've been left out of it. And so to some extent, one of our issues is the channels through which we communicate. Um, I am a sociologist, as I think many of you know, and somebody once said to me, isn't sociology just slow journalism? <laughs> I like to think it's a little bit more than that. Um, but, but it is true that we sometimes are pretty slow to respond to our critics, in part because we want to get it right. The other thing is, is that there is a, um, there is a continuous drumbeat about higher education and its failings, and I hear this all the time when I'm down in the legislature. And um, I have to keep arguing for what I call UVA exceptionalism. So all the problems that have happened to higher education anywhere, the legislator assumes must be happening in Charlottesville. So I hear I think it's awful that your students are graduating with $125,000 of debt. I said, wait a minute, two-thirds of our undergraduates have no debt, and our average student debt of those who have debt is well below the state median. So the 125,000 exists, but it exists from people who've gone to several private institutions or have uh, put a professional degree on top of a private school degree. So there are people who are paying that, but it's not us. Uh, my most famous example of that, and I'll let somebody else then have a chance to talk, was when I first came to the Commonwealth, I was invited to the executive mansion by then Governor McDonald, and he said to me, well, Terry, while you're at Virginia, one of the things I want you to do is to raise the graduation rate by 10%. <laughs> so he didn't know our graduation rate was already 93%. <laughs> um, well, it's not his fault. You know, what he heard was the drumbeat about how graduation rates are low. And he simply assumed that ours must be low, too. Uh, but anyway, that's one of the difficulties we face. There is sometimes a kernel of truth in a generalization. It is true that graduation rates at many schools are low. But it's not true of all of them. It's certainly not true of us. And the reasons it's low, frankly, has to do with the way the graduation rate is measured. And now I'm going to sound like a wonkish sociologist. But you know, um, President Obama counted in the graduation rate of no school because he transferred. Uh, and today, over 50% of American undergraduates do not end up at the school they started off with. It doesn't mean they're not graduating. It means nobody gets to count them. It's a stupid measure, and we should find a new measure. OK, somebody else. Okay. Yes, go I ahead. I have the mic. So you have the mic. Um, yeah, sure. So I guess the question that I had is it's certainly important for us to think about this in the terms of the university. And the public university has particular problems, as you highlighted. 
but it seems that there's a, a backlash against experts of all kinds. Mm -hmm. So when you see, you know, debates, and you know, I have to force myself not to watch CNN more than an hour a day. Um, you know, you hear that as sort of a general drumbeat. So are we just sort of broader collateral damage in a society that that doesn't value expertise? No, I think it went the other way. I think they started by devaluing us, and now they're extending it to other sorts of experts. And by the way, this isn't universally true. Most people, if they get cancer, want to be treated by an oncologist who's an expert in the field. Um, but it is true that there is, you know, a huge value to what is called common sense and the belief that most problems are simple and that what academics do is to complicate the problem. That's because we tend to look for nuance and for circumstances and conditions under which the solution won't work and so on. And, and some people just read that as an unwillingness to solve the problem. Um, so we are, seeing a, uh, we are seeing, I think, a reaction against experts in general. And um, I, I think you see that most clearly in the public policy realm. Even so, there are quite a few people there who aren't sure they want to make policy for the Fed without some background in economics. <laughs> yeah, because you don't need an expert for that. <laughs> uh, we have fantastic faculty here. Yes, really fantastic. But we are learning that they are fantastic when they are going to MIT or Harvard or somewhere else. And uh, what you just have said about governor request to uh, raise the graduation by 10 percent it only means that we are not doing pr well and i think that the problem which we have and not only we but other universities is to sell to taxpayer that what we are doing is really valuable and i can give very simple example that if you will go to the airport, you have a list on the computer screen or TV screen, you have a list of 100 best doctors at UVA. There is no way in 10 seconds to read even one name <laughs> and uh, print is so small that I am not able to read that, even if I will use my glasses. And I said several times, that if we would show, instead of that, somebody who is skiing on the black trail with information that this person has two artificial hips done at UVA, I think that we would uh, gain much more. And we, we really have fantastic doctor who is doing hip replacement. Yes. And I know the person who is skiing on black trails. So it's not the exams which I'm taking from the sky. And we have many, many things like that. That if students has interview in BBC and his advisor, his former advisor, former students, is giving the information to several places, the re response is zero. Hmm. Yes, so if we will not fix that, and I'm saying we not uh, for UVA, but for all uh, higher education, for all universities, private or public, I'm sorry, we have a little chance that people will really um, appreciate what we are doing. And we are doing fantastic things. I think you're right that we have not been especially gifted in telling our own story. Um, two years ago, I made a change in the way I approached the members of the legislature. When I went in to visit one of them, I brought them a single fact sheet which talked about UVA and their district. Because most of them don't represent Charlottesville. But I told them how many alumni and how many employees and how many current students and how many patients we treated at the hospital from their district. And what I find is they study that very intensely because that appeals to what their interest is. Their interest is in getting reelected, so it's a you know it's somewhat shocking to some of them to find out that they've got so many links to UVA they didn't know about. This past year, I started doing something still different. I brought with me a one-page handout, which was a graphic of a dollar bill carved up into pieces, 
and it told the listener in a very quick couple of second look how we spend the, the tuition dollar because there was all this blather out there about climbing walls and lazy rivers and things like that that we don't have. And uh, instead, you could see nearly all of this $1 bill got spent on uh, direct student education except for one penny that went to public engagement. And most people are not gonna say that you know one penny to public engagement is such a bad deal. Well, that's also proven to be very effective, and it's been more effective than my sitting there and talking to them, because they get talked to all day long. Instead, they have something that they can hang on to, show constituents, and so on. Because I began to think, what is it they need? And what they need is a way to talk to their constituent who says, this tuition money is being spent on frivolous stuff. They need to be able to say, no, that's not what it's spent on. So we have to begin thinking like our audience in terms of, what is it that they think they need to know? And we've maybe not done that well enough. And I take your point about the, uh, about the scrolling list of doctors. I think it's supposed to impress you with how long it is, and you don't even have time to read it because it's so long. But I will say there's also a terrific commercial about um, our orthopedic department uh, showing examples of people who've been, been treated by them. And it's a, pretty, it's a pretty effective commercial, I think. We're getting better at it. We got a ways to go. Yes. Terry, thanks hey, for your, hello, good evening, thanks for your talk. I'm curious, I don't know if you even want to answer this question in public, but um, <clears throat> I, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, in, to going back to your comments about <clears throat> the point of a liberal education and the goal of developing um, <clears throat> a critical thinker in our students in terms of uh, processes of thinking as opposed to you should think X or Y, um, I'm wondering if you see amongst faculty um, as a backlash to this anti-intellectualism attacking the academy, faculty putting more pressure on each other uh, as to what to think as opposed to how to think. Um, I'm not sure I've seen that. One thing I have seen is faculty sort of joining the feeding frenzy in terms of their own criticism of the university which, by the way, gives great comfort to these outsiders who want to criticize us, because then they've got material to use from inside the academy. On the other hand, in the interest of free speech, we're not going to shut that down. Um, but, you know, I do think that, uh, I do hear occasionally from students who say, you know, I believe X, Y, Z, nearly always it's a conservative student. And I'm afraid to say that in class, because I know what my professor would say. And my response is, how do you know? what your professor will say. Uh, students sometimes misunderstand that a faculty member who is playing devil's advocate is not criticizing your point of view, they're trying to make you sharpen your argument. But they take that instead as they're being put down. And so some of it is that our own pedagogical devices aren't always understood by students for what they are. Um, you know, but I encourage students who feel like their conservative points of view would not be well received to just go see a faculty member in their office and, and talk about it. Uh, because sometimes they're quite wrong. The faculty member they've been talking to might be even more conservative than they are, but has been playing devil's advocate as students say things. Or in some cases has even said something pretty outrageous to see if students will argue against it. And very often our students today are afraid to argue against it, whether they agree with it or not, not based on ideological grounds, but on the fact that they're afraid if they cross an authority figure, uh, they're gonna pay a price for it. And sometimes that more generalized approach gets focused into a more ideological answer that it's because of what I believe that I'm afraid to speak up in class. I think we have a lot to do with the millennial students to get them more comfortable with what higher education is like. You mentioned it, um, and I think you've been very effective in trying to make sure that we don't become a technical college, a, uh, uh, another vocational school as opposed to the place where we teach students to think. Uh, how can we be more effective in, in convincing legislators that that's an important thing to do? Really good question. I, I do think that sometimes examples are really helpful. Um, sometimes I have to bite my tongue. One of the Republican leaders of the House 
um, once said to me, well, how useless is a sociology degree? What could anybody ever do with a sociology degree? <laughs> and I thought, run a great research university. When I was <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say that because it would have been perceived as a put down in that situation. But I do think we have to be able to give an answer for the real anxiety people have about whether students who graduate in the humanities can find a job. Some good evidence came out about two weeks ago indicating that actually they're doing quite well in the job market. This anxiety has very pragmatic roots. In 2008, a lot of the parental generation got laid off from a job they thought was completely secure and it just pulled the rug out from under them in, in many ways. Not only did they not have enough money to send their child to college, you know, they, they were worried about having to go on welfare. And so then the overriding concern for their child going to college was, you have to do something that will get you a job when you graduate. And in many cases, the parents were very prescriptive about what that something was. It, you must be pre-med, you must go into accounting, you must go to nursing, whatever. Uh, and that has not come to an end. That is still out there. Parents are still very frightened about the prospects for their children in our labor market. By the way, I think that's also one of the roots of the um, xenophobia and anti-immigration uh, concern in the United States. It's the belief that immigrants ultimately take jobs from Americans. And you can talk all you want about how the economy grows more when you bring in the more talented immigrants and so on and so forth. Lots of people, it just doesn't make sense to them. The only thing that makes sense is that person has a job and that means some American does not have a job. It of course is not that simple, but there we are being intellectuals and complexifying things again. I don't know, hello. I don't know if you want to answer this, but could you possibly tell us what you feel is your proudest moments during these past seven or so years it's been a little bit tumultuous at times. Yeah, it has. Uh, but, <laughs> but also what you may regret when you leave the summer that sure. you didn't achieve and had hoped, had hoped for. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that. Um, well, there are a lot of moments that uh, to me were, uh, were important. Um, it was it was actually uh, a great moment for me when we had the concluding conference of the President's Commission on Slavery in the University to see that people from 54 different universities attended that, um, including schools in the UK, uh, and to realize that we had started an intellectual movement that was very worthwhile and um, was helping us uncover a chapter that had been pretty carefully covered over for a while. I'm proud of that, and I hope the next commission on um, the university in the age of segregation will also be illuminating because, you know, the, the stories of people during massive resistance are going to be lost because that generation's going to die. And so we've got a very narrow window of time to get their stories down, and I hope this commission will be doing that. But there are a lot of other things I'm proud of. I'm really thrilled about the Rotunda restoration. I'm glad about the excitement around the bicentennial. I'm happy about the new academic programs we got started. Um, and of course, back in 2012, it meant a great deal to me that you know the faculty and students I had tried hard to work for um, rallied to <laughs> rallied to my side. That was not anything that I even expected. Um, that was really quite quite remarkable. Um, some things that I wish that I'd had gotten done, and we didn't really quite get it there. Um, we need to do a lot more in the quantitative social sciences and business. <laughs> because we need greater analytic power there, and we have not been able to pull that together in the way I would like to. But there are some promising signs out there that I think will eventually get us there. I'd hoped we'd make more progress in making it easier to do funded research. Again, we're getting there, but we're not quite there yet. Um, if you come to the university and you've never written a research proposal before, we ought to make it really easy for you to learn how to write one. And we haven't done that. That would be something that would really be extremely beneficial. Not so much, you know, with the natural scientists who on their postdoc wrote six proposals with their professor, um, and not so much with the biomedical researchers who couldn't have gotten the job here if they didn't know how to write research proposals. But it's really important in those fields where funding actually is available, but graduate training doesn't normally include um, teaching that. 
The provost has an ambitious idea that it, um, I think I won't be able to see come to fruition, but I'm excited about it, called PhD Plus, and it is a way of providing a wider toolkit to PhD students who want it because their objective may be not to look for a traditional academic job, but to look for a job in some other setting. Or if they want to look for an academic job, to give them a good background in pedagogy and other things they need to know to be effective faculty members. We're just getting that started, and I'm sorry, we didn't get that done earlier. Um, but there's a lot to do. <laughs> and then as to what I'm going to do when I leave, I do have a research leave coming in my contract. And uh, my husband and I intend to go to Austin, Texas. Uh, our two sons live there, and um, uh, we're both emeriti at University of Texas, and Doug will teach there at the law school while I try to get my undergraduate demography courses back into shape to teach. Because it's been a long time since I was teaching full-time, and those classes need a lot of updating. Um, and, and Texas happens to be a really good place in my field uh, to do that. Uh, when we come back, the board has given me a five-year lease on the Sprig Lane House, which is between the alumni house and the IRC. And so that will be our address in Charlottesville, at least for a while. Thank you. Yeah? Right? Okay. As a sociologist, you mentioned that uh, the percentage of people who thought uh, that higher education was doing its job and public education was falling by the precipitancy of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from the highways to, uh, you name it, uh, uh, you know, privatize the air traffic controllers, privatize this, privatize that. And I was wondering how, uh, whether the decline has been more steep, less steep, or about on the same slope, let's say, as other types of public goods that are also being attacked, and rather consistently by certain players uh, who have been trying to essentially Well, that's a really good question, and you're right. There is certainly, um, a, yeah, the question is, it's, uh, I'm going to paraphrase you now, right? <laughs> the question is, it's not just public higher education, it's also the public sector in, in many other domains, uh, that there is a, a concerted attack on the public sector uh, and a belief that you should privatize more functions. Certainly true. And I, I really can't say to what extent those are connected to each other, but it does make a certain amount of sense, certainly. Um, and the notion that public goods are something that the polity ought to provide its citizens is surprisingly an idea under pretty robust attack in some quarters. Um, in fact, in the state of Texas, the textbook commission tried to ban the phrase common good in the discussions of Thomas Jefferson because they felt that was socialistic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they didn't succeed in that, but it's just an, it's just an example of um, the extent to which there is a pretty thoroughgoing rejection of what we consider to be public goods and services. We see this in a lot of, um, a lot of domains right now, including the provision of health care and the extent to which government should or should not play a role in health care. Um, since the university is involved in both higher education and health care, those are probably the two domains I know the best. But you mentioned a number of other examples of efforts to privatize prisons, air traffic controllers, lots of other things. Yeah. I have a sociologist question for you as yeah. well, first of all. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing all your thoughts with us. Um, it seems to me that m many of the questions here and some of your remarks um, have dealt with a phenomenon that I've observed. I've been here for 30 years. I'm a clinician. I see students as patients um, in the Student Health Center. And over that time, um, it seems like there's been a marked change from sort of the adoration of expertise briefly into an acknowledgment of the importance of data and evidence, but now increasingly into the really the apotheosis of the narrative, the story, the individual perspective. And I'm wondering if you could share, you know, your perspective of a, as a sociologist on that phenomenon, which I think probably pertains not only to medicine, but to several other areas as well. You know, the millennial generation actually is rather different in a number of ways from the groups of students that we have um, handled before. Why that's different is usually attributed either to social media or to a different form of parenting. 
a somewhat clingier form of parenting. And um, the extent to which that has legitimized my opinion is as good as your opinion, and everything is an opinion, uh, I think is, you know, that's, that's really the issue we confront in the classroom. Some things aren't opinions. Some things are facts. And um, we have a really fundamental form of literacy to embark on with our students, which we didn't have to do in the past, which is what is the difference between fact and opinion? You know, journal, uh, Journalism 101 taught that for years. Uh, but even among the journalists, there seems to be a preference now for narrative as, as opposed to a hard-hitting and factually based story, at least in some outlets. Um, I, I don't know if this is going to continue or if we might move back to the data-based and evidence-oriented um, uh, uh, sort of approach. But I agree, with your, I agree with your view. I think that there has been um, a, a certain transition here that's uh, I think troubling for those of us in the academy. Hard to imagine some of these students teaching students on their own. So I have a question that's a follow-up to that, and that is, what do you think the impact of the 24-hour news cycle and everybody being an expert and everybody having an opinion on 50 channels on all of our televisions, what do you think that, do you think that is more evidence or related to to that, I mean, the, the facts are getting lost in the, in the discussion because everybody's got a, talk, a news talk show. Right. Well, and I think that there has been a succession of goals here from conveying the news to entertaining the public. And so there's a preference for uh, people who shout at each other instead of just you know, people who are trying to express a point of view. Um, and there's just a tremendous level of noise and I, the level of noise and the level of distraction poses its own set of problems. The Russians have evidently taken advantage of that situation um, to create a little more noise and uh, a little more dust and to seek ways to um, take an already polarized discourse and polarize it a little bit more. Um, you know, so at least some clinicians who work with depressed young people advise them first to go on a social media fast so that their heads are not always full of everything that's going on on social media and they just have a chance to calm down and um, reflect a little more on you know, their lives and what's going on around them. Um, so I, I, do think that the, I do think that the media cycle has plenty of negative effects. Now the advantage is if it happens, it's going to be breaking news and you're going to know about it. And so just how many hours do you want to keep watching to see what the breaking news is? <laughs> do we have any other questions? Oh, we have one more question. I'm going to make this the last one so you all have a chance to get your dinners. I think uh, we, we have a hard time explaining to the public what we do in academia. And I remember years, years ago, my most admired professor, who, who has been my tutor, and the person I admire the most as intellectual, one time I saw him in the, in the, <clears throat> in the department. I asked him, oh, what are you doing these days? What, what are you involved with? What, what kind of research am I? He said, oh, I'm having a great time. And he said, what are you doing? He says, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, in part, we think. <laughs> And thinking does, doesn't produce necessarily something material. And, and the fact that, that we have a, a, a hard time explaining that we do research and we can be six, seven years doing research, outside the academia is very difficult to sell. And even some of our friends who we have dinners consistently with us, they still laugh at us because they so what are you doing these days? Well, how many classes are you teaching? And uh, so th they need something that is accountable. And, and, and so and this part, the outside academia, is, is difficult to understand. I, right. uh, I agree with that. I think it is difficult. I remember um, when I was an assistant professor, I was home visiting my mother. And, and she said, well, you know, what are you doing now? And I said, well, you know, it's been great since classes have ended. I've had time to do my own work. And she looked at me really puzzled and said, Whose work were you doing before? <laughs> well, we all know what that means, you know, but, but we do have a kind of lingo of our own that is impenetrable to people from the outside. 
Um, and, and the other thing is the job entails many more duties that people on the outside don't really understand. This goes back to the fact that our models of shared governance in which decisions about who to admit to a graduate program, decisions about who to hire in the department, consultations about who will be department chair and so on, that takes time from everybody. And we think that's time well put in, um, but many people who come as consultants to us from outside firms think that's a waste of time. And we could be much more efficient if those decisions were made more expeditiously by a smaller number of people. <clears throat> it's hard to explain why we don't think that's true. Uh, but we do have a very different model. By the way, one of the things I found working with the Board of Visitors is the visitor most likely to understand uh, self-governance uh, is in a law firm. Because in a law firm, um, the, the most successful people can walk out the door any afternoon and have a job across the street. And so you gotta keep those people engaged. Everybody's got their own specialty, and so you have to pay due deference to people's expertise. Um, and there are some big egos involved. And yes, I know, it's hard to believe. Law partners get that in a way that people who own their own business do not. Because the people who own their own business are used to essentially a command and control where everybody does what they say. And they don't really understand why I don't get up in the morning and just tell all of you what to do. That doesn't work. <laughs> You've been a delightful audience. I have so much enjoyed being with you.